I'd like to tell you five stories about Captain Beaky and his band. Now, the first one is called The Search for Hissing Sid. Captain Beaky and his band were all at Artful Owl's hollow tree house for tea. The late afternoon sun shone through a big knot hole, and Reckless Rat pulled his hat down over his long nose to stop it getting sunburnt. What are we going to do about hissing Sid? said Timmy Toad, taking a big bite of chocolate cake. Toad was always very brave when there was no danger, and Owl's house was a very safe place. Not only was it inside a tree, but it was very high up inside a tree. It's time we did something, said Toad, but his mouth was so full no one quite heard what he said. Don't drop crumbs on the floor, said Owl crossly, and producing a small dustpan and using his wing like a brush, he bent down and swept them up. Captain Beaky sat back and gave a yawn. <gasps> oh, the woodland folk can't sleep, he said, in case Slippery Sid slithers into their houses and gives someone a bite. I can sleep, said Batty Bat. He never kept me awake. That's because you're always hanging from an high branch, said Reckless Rat. I always think, said Toad, that it's a very dangerous way to sleep. I mean, what if Bat lets go of the branch in his sleep? If he does, said Owl, he'll fall on something very soft, his head. Well, look, never mind about Bat's soft head, said Captain Beaky. We're here to talk about hissing Sid. Here, yeah, here, yeah, said Reckless Rat. Well, come on, said Captain Beaky. Let's have some ideas. Captain Beaky always asked the rest of the band for their ideas. There were two reasons for this. First, one of them just might have a very good idea, or even a bad idea. And the second reason was that Captain Beaky very often didn't have any ideas at all. But as he was their leader, he didn't want anyone to know that. Come on, he said. Someone must have an idea. What about you, Rat? I, I see your nose is twitching. Well, said Rat, I could. I mean, that is if I saw Sid shiver by, I could. That is, if he didn't see me first, I could. Well, that is, to be precise, I could practice for a bit. Oh, for heaven's sake, said Al, get on with it. What could you do? Well, I could lasso it with my tail, said Rat. An old uncle of mine showed me how to do it when I was little. He could make his tail into a lasso and remove a piece of cheese from a mousetrap without going anywhere near it. You introduced me to him once, said Bat. Now, what was his name again? I forget. Tailless Uncle Fred, said Rat. I'm putting good ideas down in this notebook, said Captain Beaky, and I'm not writing that one down. Bat suddenly gave an excited squeak. I've got one, he said. Captain Beaky licked the end of his pencil. What is it then? Well, said Bat, I get a boulder and I'll fly up in the sky, and then when Sid slithers down underneath, I'll drop it on his head. Oh, good idea, said Timid Toad, dropping more crumbs on the floor in his excitement. Rat nodded approvingly. How will you lift it off the ground? said Owl, as he swept up the crumbs by Timid Toad's feet. Captain Beaky, who had just been writing B for Boulder, changed his mind and wrote, Bad idea. Well, we won't find Sid while we're sitting here, said Owl, putting his dustpan away. Oh, yes, that's true, said Timid Toad, looking very relieved. We've got to go out and search the wood, continued Owl. Uh, we'll send Bat up in the sky to look down, and when he spots him, he can send us a signal. Oh, that's it, said Captain Beaky. Five of us should be enough to overpower him. Toad put his hand up. Ah, I think, said Toad, that four's enough. If there were five, we might get in each other's way. In fact, I think I should hold back and only jump on him if he seems to be winning. Toad's got something there, said Arthur Lyle. We only need four of us. Not that I'm scared, said Timmy Toad hurriedly. No, 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 said Al. You'll be left all by yourself. Timmy Toad tried to look disappointed. Oh, dear, he said. I do wish I were coming with you. And getting to his feet and clenching his fist, he shadow-boxed with an imaginary foe. Al shook his head. You won't be with us, said Al, because we shall be using you as bait to trap hissing Sid. Bait, said Timmy Toad. Oh, dear. He collapsed back into his chair, looking rather pale. Uh, are you sh sure it's a good idea? He stammered. Well, it must be a good idea, said Captain Beaky. Look, I've written it down in the book. He held the notebook under Toad's nose. Toad read the words. Toad to be bait to capture Hissing Sid. And then in even bigger letters, this is a good idea. Lest anyone has a better idea, said Captain Beaky, this is the idea we'll use. Oh, uh, someone must have a better idea, said Toad. Uh, uh, what about you, Al? Haven't you got a better idea? This was my better idea, said Al. When do we do it, said Reckless Rat. I just feel like a fight. Uh, I think I'm free next week said Toad. Uh, nearer the end of the week, that is. I think I'm rather busy at the beginning of the week. 
I think tonight would be rather a good night to do it, said Captain Beaky. There's a full moon. Toad put his hand up. Toad agrees with tonight, said Captain Beaky. Now what about you others? The others put their hands up too. I only put my hand up, said Timmy Toad, because I want to remind you all that if there's a full moon, hissing Sid would see us all, which makes it a bad idea. But as his mouth was full of cake again, nobody heard him. So that night, Timmy Toad, his eyes popping with fear, sat alone somewhere in the wood, while Captain Beaky and his band waited for a signal from Batty Bat, who was busy flying above the moonlit woods. Owl, who had been listening keenly, with his hand cupped to his ear, suddenly heard Bat's signal. Dot, dot, dash, 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 dot. And then a lot of dots and a lot of dashes. No, said Owl. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Oh, dear, 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 dear. What's up? whispered Rat. It's hissing Sid, said Owl. He's found Toad. Oh, good show, said Captain Beaky. Let's go and rescue him. I'm afraid we're too late, said Owl. He swallowed him. Swallowed Toad, said Rat. What are we going to do? But before anybody could think what to do, there was a loud noise in the undergrowth, and before their startled eyes, hissing Sid appeared. His eyes were crossed, and he had a very, very strange look on his face. What's more, he wasn't slithering like he usually did. He was going along in a series of big jumps, and right in the middle of his long body was a lump. It's Toad, whispered Owl, in hissing Sid's tummy. You're right, said Captain Beaky. Oh, quick, men, we mustn't let him get away. And turning on his heel, he ran headfirst into a tree and sat down with a bump. Ow! My head, he said. Ooh, that hurt. Quick, cried Reckless Rat. Let's get a long stick and stop Sid going back down his hole to hide. And so off they chased, with Captain Beaky rubbing his head, and they followed the noise that hissing Sid made as he bounced through the woods back to where he lived. There's his home, shouted Captain Beaky as Sid headed for a big hole by the river bank. But to their surprise, Sid went straight past it. It's Toad jumping, shouted Rat. Sid can't stop. Keep it up, Toad, they shouted. And then, led by Captain Beaky, they chased on through the night. Finally, they found hissing Sid lying down in a clearing with his mouth open, gasping. <sighs> help, said a small voice. Help, help, it's me, Toad, help. Captain Beaky reached down inside the snake's big mouth and pulled out a very frightened-looking Toad. Oh, well done, Toad, said Rat. That was very brave of you. Fancy jumping into a snake. I agree, said Bat. That's just my sort of plan. Toad's one of the bravest animals in the wood. What do you mean, brave, said Toad? I jumped into what I thought was a hollow stick. <laughs> Nonsense, said Captain Beaky. You're just saying that to be modest. He patted Toad on the back and smiled at him proudly. Am I, said Toad? Yes, I suppose I am. Yes, there's no point in being modest, is there? Yes, I admit it was rather brave of me. And then he jumped into Owl's arms as Hissing Sid gave a wheezing cough and wriggled off as fast as he could. I don't think we'll see him again for some time, said Captain Beaky. I think you gave him a very nasty shock. Well done again. And off they marched through the wood, singing their song, the main words of which are, The bravest animals in the land are Captain Beaky and his band. And as it had started to rain, Bat flew above them, holding his wings flat, just like an umbrella, to keep them dry. Well, that was Owl's idea, of course. And as for Timid Toad, he marched at the front with Captain Beaky and told them all how he had deliberately jumped into Sid's mouth when he found him yawning. He told them so many times that by the time they got home, they were all yawning too. <sighs> My next story is called The Trial of Hissing Sid. Captain Beaky and his band were having a meeting at Artful Owl's house. It was obviously a very special occasion, because Reckless Rat's hat and overcoat were very nicely brushed and pressed. Batty Bat had combed his hair. Captain Beaky was wearing his best naval cap with a brightly polished badge, and Timid Toad was washing his muddy feet in a small basin of water. <sighs> I do wish, said Artful Owl with a sigh, that you'd wash your feet before you come to my home, Toad. I did said Timmy Toad, but they got muddy again on the way. Owl sighed again, and turning to the mirror, propped up against the wall, he gazed at his reflection. How do I look? said Artful Owl. That white curly wig and those glasses make you look very stern indeed, said Captain Beaky. And, said Owl proudly, can you see my black legal coat has a beautiful red lining? You really look the part, said Rat admiringly. I am the part, said Owl. I am legal prosecutor, 
at the trial of Hissing Sid. And you, my friends, are to be witnesses of his evil deeds. Bat scratched his head. What evil deeds are they? Oh, my memory is very bad. Captain Beaky produced a piece of paper. I've written them down to remind us, he said. Let me see. The stealing of Man to the Mouse's candy, abducting a cuckoo, and generally frightening people. Toad put his hand up. Uh, don't forget he swallowed me. That has to be a crime, and it's called, um, now what could it be called? I know, said Batty Bat. Toad aside. That's a good name for it, said Owl. It's quite clear I've got an open and shut case. Oh, good, said Captain Beaky. You can put this piece of paper in it. I mean, said Owl, adopting a pompous legal voice, that when I produce the evidence of the evil deeds, the judge will send him to jail. Reckless Rat reached into the pocket of his long black overcoat and produced an old watch. Time we were at the Woodland Court. In fact, Al spent so long looking at himself in the mirror, we're already late. And so, led by Captain Beaky, they ran down the long and winding wooden staircase, out of the front door and into the wood. In the Woodland Courtroom, Lord Chief Justice Pig looked at his big cuckoo clock on the wall and banged his small wooden hammer impatiently on the desk. <coughs> Beaky and his band are late, he said. I am not very pleased, and he gave a loud snort to show how displeased he was. They've arrived, sir, shouted P.C. Sparrow. Come on there, we haven't got all day. Captain Beaky, Owl, Rat, Bat and Timid Toad ran up the courtroom steps. They had run so fast that Captain Beaky's best hat had caught in a bramble bush and got torn and the badge was missing. Bat's hair was standing up on end, and Rat's best overcoat was covered in leaves and bits of thistledown and fern and Timmy Toad had one very muddy foot, because he'd hopped to the court on one leg to try and keep at least one foot clean for the trial. There was a loud hiss from the dock, and glancing toward it they saw Hissing Sid with lots of handcuffs all over him, and on either side of him, all in black, were two jackdaw jailers. I protest, hissed Hissing Sid, at this trial I am innocent. Silence in court, said Lord Justice Pig. And then to show how annoyed he was, he shouted, Silence! again. But the twelve rabbits in the jury kept up an excited conversation amongst themselves. Justice Pig banged his hammer twice. Order, 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 he cried. Timmy Toad put his hand up. I'll have a lemon tea, he said. Make mine an ice cream, said Betty Bat. A chocolate one, if you've got it. I mean silence in court, shouted Justice Pig. Now who is defending hissing Sid? I am, said the deep, rasping voice of Q.C. Crow. I am defending this innocent snake from these ridiculous accusations made by Captain Beaky and his silly little man. How would you like a punch in the ear, said Reckless Rat. Justice Pig banged his hammer again. I won't have talking in my court, he snorted. The very next person to speak will be thrown out. Artful Owl took off his wig and waved it to attract Justice Pig's attention. I trust, my lord, said Owl, as prosecution that I shall be allowed to speak. Yes, 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 of course, said Justice Pig. Now get on with it. What evil deeds has the prisoner done? Artful Owl turned to Captain Beaky. Uh, Captain Beaky, pass me that piece of paper with the evil deeds on, will you? Captain Beaky took off his hat and peered inside. I, I think it's gone, he said. Oh, no, I remember now. I gave it to Rat. Reckless Rat put his hand in his pocket. Oh, yes, said Rat. Yes, yes, it's in here somewhere. And he searched for a moment, and then he started to look anxious. Come on, come on, said Owl impatiently. There must be something in there. There is, said Rat. A large hole. I keep meaning to get it mended. Try the other pocket, whispered Captain Beaky, and be quick. Reckless Rat tried the other pocket and gave a smile of relief. Here we are, he said, and handed Artful Owl a crumpled piece of paper. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, said Owl, in his loudest and most pompous voice, the crimes which the evil snake has been accused of are written down on this paper, and they are as follows. That he did willfully... Owl glanced down at the paper. Collect washing from the laundry? Mend hole in overcoat by cheese? He looked up surprised. What is this, he said. Oh, I'm sorry, said Rat. That's part of my shopping list. You see Crow held up his hand. I think, my lord, you will agree there is no case to answer. Just a minute there, said Reckless Rat. It's in here somewhere and taking off his hat and overcoat, assisted by Timid Toad and Captain Beaky and Bat, he searched all the pockets inside and out, and the lining, and inside his hat, but without success. 
Artful Al took the coat and hat and hung it over the rail of the dock and addressed the judge. <clears throat> Despite the fact, Your Lordship, said Al, that we cannot find the legal document to which I have referred, my memory is such that I can tell you the crimes that the accused has committed. Captain Beaky tugged at the end of Al's long black coat. I'm afraid we're too late, he whispered. What do you mean, said Al? Look at the jury, said Captain Beaky. What's wrong with the jury, said Timid Toad? Rabbits make very good jurors, provided they've got plenty of lettuce and a carrot or two. Well, there were twelve when we started, said Captain Beaky. Look at them now. They've multiplied. At least twenty-three. Twenty-four, snorted Justice Pig. There's one under my chair here. This trial is most unfair, said QC Crow. These new arrivals are far too young to know good from bad. I say that this trial should be stopped here and now, and I submit that my client is innocent. With a sweep of his arm, he pointed at the dock. But the dock was empty, except for two jackdaw jailers handcuffed together. Good heavens, he's gone, said Rat. He's been to my best overcoat and my best set. Good heavens, said Captain Beaky. He's disguised himself. Justice Pig leant forward and pointed to the jailers with the hammer. Why didn't you jailers call out, he said, and tell us that the, the villain was escaping? You told us not a talking court, one of them replied. Lord Justice Pig went red in the face, and then purple, and then to stop himself saying anything he shouldn't say in court, he took off his wig and stuffed it into his mouth. Quick, men, cried Captain Beaky, we've got to catch that slippery snake. And leading the way, he ran down the courtroom steps and out into the woodland, followed by the others. I'll fly up in the sky, said Bat, and I'll send a signal down in Morse code the moment that I spot him. We must search high and low, said Captain Beaky. I agree, said Al, and not forgetting all points in between. After a lot of running to and fro, and fro and to, and twice to and fro, which of course is four, Captain Beaky and his band, that is all except Batty Bat, who was just a black dot against the blue sky, paused not far from the river bank, panting. Oh, it's no good, said Al. We'll just have to hope that Bat can spot him. I'm not running another step said Timmy Toad. In fact, I'm going to hold my breath and hide behind a tree until he's caught. And before anyone could disagree with Toad's plan, he sat down in the shade of a big tree and took a very large, deep breath and swelled up to twice his normal size and changed colour to match the green of the surrounding grass. A series of ear-piercing squeaks, like a piece of chalk on a blackboard, reached their ears, and looking up, they saw Batty Bat hovering high above them. He started squeaking in Morse code. What does he say? said Captain Beaky. S.O.S., said Owl. I'm afraid it means snake out of sight. Captain Beaky took off his hat and fanned himself. Phew, he said. It's getting very warm. Look, how about going for a sail on my biscuit tin, the HMS most leaky? Artful Owl nodded. A good idea, he said. This wig's making my head itch. And taking off his legal wig, he put it in his pocket. Hang on, said Rat. What about my hat and my coat? Who needs a hat and coat in this weather, said Owl. Now, if you really want to wear a coat, you can have mine. And taking off his long legal coat, he handed it over to Reckless Rat. That's most kind of you, said Rat. It's really quite the best present I've ever had. It's not a present, said Al. It's just too hot for me to wear. I shall want it back again as soon as we get home. And so they went down to the river and boarded Beaky's biscuit tin. Hoisting the handkerchief sail, they got a long stick and pushed themselves away from the bank and out into the river. It was only then and Rat was first to notice it, that although Timid Toad had come with them, he was still nearly twice his usual size, and his eyes were nearly popping out of his head. Oh, look at Toad, said Rat. He's still holding his breath. Oh dear, said Captain Beaky. He's held it so long that he can't let it out. Oh dear, what are we going to do? Artful Owl reached down into the boat and produced from a great assortment of bits and pieces that were always at the bottom a large pepper pot. This should do the trick, he said apart from which the windows dropped and we need the extra breeze. Taking Toad by the arm, he made him stand behind the ship's sail, and holding the pepper pot above Toad's head, he shook it. Toad gave the loudest sneeze anyone had ever heard, and he kept on sneezing, and the sail pulled the HMS Most Leaky along faster than it had ever been before. The sheer joy of sailing on such a lovely day made them all forget about the stuffy old courtroom and hissing Sid. But from a dark hole in the river bank, two beady eyes beneath the brim of Rat's hat watched them as they disappeared round a bend in the river. And from that dark, cool hiding place came a long sigh of relief.
Now I'm going to tell you about Captain Beaky's search for summer. The first signs of winter had come to the wood, and the squirrels were busy scurrying about with as many nuts as they could carry. Above the fields, a crowd of swallows were making a final circle under the grey afternoon sky before they departed for the winter. A squirrel, running along one of the narrow woodland paths, carrying an armful of nuts, suddenly stopped and pricked up his ears, as a strange puffing, panting and thumping sound that was getting nearer transfixed him to the spot. And then an extraordinary sight met his startled gaze. Captain Beaky, in running shorts, puffing and panting as he ran. The sight gave the squirrel such a shock that he threw his armful of nuts in the air and ran up the nearest tree. And from that vantage point he observed that Captain Beaky was being followed, also in running shorts, by Artful Owl and Reckless Rat. And the trio were being followed in turn by another pair of running shorts that were hopping along, without as far as the squirrel could tell, anybody being in them. It was quite a relief to him when he heard Timid Toad's voice call from inside the hopping shorts, I say, fellows, hold on, wait for me. Captain Beaky stopped. How can we ever get fit, he panted, if every five minutes we have to stop for Toad? Reckless Rat blew on his hands and rubbed them together. It's all Al's fault, he said. He shouldn't have lent Toad his shorts. They're too big for him. In fact, they're so big he keeps getting lost in them. We've already had to go look for him twice. One must dress correctly, said Al. After all, Captain Beaky and his band are regarded as the bravest and most intelligent animals in the wood. And when we go jogging, we must be seen to be dressed in the right clothes. Oh, quite right, said Captain Beaky. Well, I agree, said Rat, that we are brave going out in these shorts, but I'm not so sure that it's very intelligent. Look at my kneecaps. They've gone blue and they're jumping up and down. At that moment, Owl's spare running shorts hopped past them. Wait for me, called Toad. Wait for me. We've stopped, shouted Captain Beaky. Come back here. The gaily coloured shorts stopped and Timid Toad climbed out. I'm fed up with these morning runs, he said. Look at these bumps on my head where I keep banging into things. We've got to keep fit for the winter, said Owl. Otherwise we'll all get colds. I'd like to be in bed with a cold, said Rat. At least I'd be warm. Owl flapped his wings across his chest. It is getting a bit chilly. Let's all go back to my place and I'll light a fire and we can have tea. Well, I was thinking of running a few more miles, said Captain Beaky. But if you all want to give in and go home for tea, I suppose I'll have to join you. And running energetically on the spot to show how many more miles he could have run if he'd wanted to, he shouted, Right, men, follow me! and pulling down his naval cap firmly over his ears to keep them warm, Captain Beaky led the way to Owl's house. The arrival of winter was of great concern to another well-known person in the wood, Hissing Sid the snake. Like all snakes, Hissing Sid always slept right the way through the winter, with his big old alarm clock set to ring on the first day of spring. Hissing Sid had already wound up his alarm clock and was just about to go to bed when he noticed a leak in the wall of his underground hideaway. I always knew I was too near the river, hissed Sid. That trip's going to keep me awake all winter. Then wrapping his scarf twenty-seven times tightly round his neck, he slid out of his hole to find something to make his home waterproof. Less than ten minutes later, he was on his way home again, with a big smile on his face, for held tightly between his teeth was the end of a big plastic rubbish bag. This will make a wonderful sleeping bag, hissed Sid to himself. What a stroke of luck! But just at that moment Sid's luck ran out, for to his ears came the sound of running feet, accompanied by much gasping and panting, and then, to his surprise, Owl's running shorts hopped into view. Ah! <gasps> haunted shorts, said Sid. Oh, no! Help! Help! And dropping his bag, he slithered off as fast as he could. Look at that, said Artful Owl, littering the woods. Disgraceful! And bending down, he picked up the rubbish bag, rolled it up, and put it under Rat's arm. We'll take it home and throw it away. It's already been thrown away, said Rat. We'll throw it away where people can't find it, said Al. Well, we'll be able to find it, said Rat, because we'll be the ones what will have thrown it away. We'll get Toad to throw it away, said Captain Beaky. He'll never remember where it is. Now come on, my feet are freezing. A short while later they were all sitting round the fire in Owl's hollow treehouse. The fireplace consisted of an old copper frying pan in the centre of the room, on which a bundle of twigs burned brightly. Whiffs of smoke drifted up towards the ceiling and disappeared into the dark, hollow tree trunk above their heads. Rat searched in a small paper bag and produced a chocolate. I'm uh, afraid it's nearly the last one, he said, popping it into his mouth. I don't like the winter, said Toad. Why do we have to have one? So that someone else can have the summer, said Owl. You mean, said Reckless Rat, that our summer is going on somewhere else while we're here? 
Of course, said Al, it's miles and miles away. Uh, too far to walk, I suppose, said Captain Beaky. Much too far, said Al. It's on the other side of the world. Just then they heard a high-pitched cough, and Batty Bat flew down from the chimney. I say, squeaked Bat, do let me know next time you're lighting a fire, and I'll sleep somewhere else. I'm covered in soot. We'll go and have a wash, then, said Rat. Then you can hang out somewhere and drip dry. And producing one more sweep from the bag, he popped it into his mouth, leant forward, and threw the paper bag into the fire. But instead of falling into the flames, it floated towards the ceiling, and they all gazed at it as it hovered for a moment, and then it disappeared up the chimney. I say, said Captain Beaky, that's rather strange. Not at all, said Al. Fill a paper bag with hot air, and it's bound to rise. Then, leaping to his feet, he said, Ah, oh, of course. What a good idea. Why didn't I think of it before? I say, gosh, I'm clever. Uh, what is it? said Toad. Uh, what good idea? Uh, the one I've just had, said Al. Now, how would you all like to come and find the summer with me? You said it was miles away, said Captain Beaky. Not by balloon, said Al. We haven't got a balloon, said Rat. We have, said Al, one large plastic rubbish bag. All we have to do is fill it with hot air, and it'll float off. Uh, how do we fill it with hot air, said Timmy Toad? Simple, said Rat. We'll get Al to talk into it. I'll ignore that, said Al. I say, said Captain Beaky, that sounds jolly exciting. When shall we give it a try? First thing in the morning, said Al. Very early the next morning, Captain Beaky and his band marched down to the river where their boat, the HMS Most Leaky, was moored. With them, they had, in addition to the rubbish bag, a pocket full of candles, a compass, a basket of provisions, matches and a telescope, and a lot of string. The idea, said Al, is that we tie the bottom of the bag to the sides of the boat, light the candles, and the hot air will fill the bag. We all climb in, and off we go. We won't go too high, will we, said Toad. Now, if we get off the ground at all, if you ask me, said Rat. Down by the river they busied themselves tying the rubbish bag to the biscuit tin, unaware that a pair of beady eyes were watching them. So that's where my sleeping bag has got to, he said. I might have guessed. And slithering nearer, he strained his ears to hear what they were saying. It's all tied on, said Rat. I hope this works. So do I, said Bat. I'm freezing. I think we should go home, said Timmy Toad. It's getting rather foggy. Oh, stop moaning, said Captain Beaky. Now, Rat, you pull the bottom of the bag up above the boat. I'll light the candles. And taking a box of matches out of his pocket, he struck light to a cluster of small coloured candles that stood in the centre of the boat. I hope this works, said Toad. I was saving those for my birthday cake. Sid raised his head and stared with amazement as the rubbish bag got bigger and bigger and bigger. It's working, squeaked Bat. We're going to find the summer. I was never in any doubt, said Al. Quick, climb aboard, said Captain Beaky. It's starting to move. They all climbed aboard except Toad, when the biscuit tin suddenly left the ground. Quick, grab that string, said Rat. With a desperate hop, timid Toad caught hold of the string that Rat had thrown to him, and he held on, shutting his eyes tightly. And when he opened them, the river looked like a piece of silver ribbon below. Help, said Toad. Hang on, said Captain Beaky. We're pulling you up. And after a lot of heaving and cries of, Don't look down, Toad, he was pulled aboard. Down below, hissing Sid gazed up at the sky till they were out of sight. It was only then that he realised he had his mouth wide open with surprise and there was a lot of cold air going in, so he shut it. Well, if Beaky and his band were going away, thought Sid, I know a nice warm place to spend the winter. And slithering off, he headed for Owl's house. Fog's coming down again, said Captain Beaky. I can't see a thing. He peered anxiously through his telescope. Well, said Rat, by my watch we've been up here for nearly an hour. And we're running out of candles, said Bat. It was a big mistake, said Rat, not using Owl's birthday candles. He's so old we could have stayed up here for days. How much further do you think the summer is, said Captain Beaky. Well, it all depends on which way we're going, and without the sun I can't read the compass, said Owl. Well, put your glasses on, said Rat. I mean, said Owl, I need the sun to work out our position. We're probably thousands of feet up in the sky and travelling very quickly indeed southwards. Or northwards, depending on the wind. If we're thousands of feet up in the sky, said Rat, why is that squirrel waving to us from the top of that tree? Hold on, said Captain Beaky. I, I, I think we're coming down. We're just skimming along the, the tops of the trees. I say, look out, we're going to crash if we're not careful. Owl glanced over the side anxiously. Uh, they look like foreign trees to me, said Owl, hopefully. There's one or two I don't recognise. If we don't throw something out quick, said Rat, we're going to crash. And picking up a basket of provisions, he held them over the side. 
but before he could drop them, they crashed into the top of a large tree and remained there, stuck fast. Good heaven, said Captain Beaky, where are we? Oh, uh, probably France or Spain or somewhere well on the way, I'm sure, said Al. Uh, get the rope ladder and we'll climb down. One by one they climbed down the rope ladder that was always kept in the bottom of the boat. Timid Toad jumped from the end to the ground. This tree's got a door in it, said Timid Toad. I think somebody lives here. They do indeed, said Rat, as he jumped to the ground. An old idiot lives here. Owl, who was puffing and panting as he climbed down, paused. How do you know that, he said. Because his name's above the door, said Rat. Look. Owl put on his spectacles and peered. The sign above the door read, Owl's House. A short while later, the frying pan fire burned brightly as they all sat round warming themselves. Well, it was a good idea, said Captain Beaky, but I think I'd rather spend the winter here. Owl gave an embarrassed cough. Oh, yes, well, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but one learns by one's mistakes, and I mean nothing's been lost. Except our boat, said Rat, which is now on the roof. Ah, I've got a good idea how to get that down, said Owl. But only the sound of snoring greeted his remark, <clears throat> which I shall tell you in the summer, he added. And lying back in his chair, he closed his eyes, and his snores soon joined the others. From the end of one of the hollow branches leading off the chimney, there came an even louder snore. Hissing Sid had found a very comfortable place to sleep, and as long as Captain Beaky and his band kept that fire burning, he was going to spend the winter in the warmest place in the wood. This story is called Captain Beaky and the Haunted Wood. Captain Beaky and his trusted band of followers were all working very hard painting the HMS Most Leaky, their biscuit tin boat. They had decided to paint it blue. Now this really wasn't a very difficult decision to make, because they only had two tins of paint, one blue and one green, and the lid of the green paint was stuck on so firmly that no one could get it off. There was already quite a lot of blue paint on the boat and on Reckless Rat's hat. There was also quite a bit on Captain Beaky's nose, Al's feet, and Batty Bat's wings, and Timid Toad was blue from head to foot. He'd been standing on the edge of the paint pot to paint the mast, and on stepping back to admire his handiwork, he had disappeared with a plop, and had to be pulled out gasping and spluttering and blowing blue bubbles. To make matters worse, he tried to clean himself up with the handkerchief sail and made himself very unpopular, as now that was blue as well. And so they were all very relieved when an aged mole staggered out of the wood shouting, Stop work! We need your help. Trouble, men, said Captain Beaky. We'll have to stop work. So putting their brushes into a small jam jar full of turpentine, they sat down and listened to the aged mole's story. Last night, said aged mole, I was patrolling the wood when I spotted hissing Sid. Then lowering his voice, he continued, He had such an evil look on his face that I decided to follow him. Uh, could you speak up, said Toad? I'm afraid I've got some blue paint in my ear. I don't see why you had to mention blue paint, said Al. You'd be just as deaf if it was green. What was that, said Toad? Never mind, said Captain Beaky in a loud voice. Let's hear Mole's story. Uh, speak up, Mole. Where was I, said aged Mole. Following Sid, said Reckless Rat. Now get on with the story. What happened? It was a very dark part of the wood, said Mole. Sid came face to face with Mandy the Mouse. Well, well, what happened, said Captain Beaky impatiently. Well, said the aged Mole. She had a big box of candy with her, and before she could run, Sid had tied her to a tree with her tail and taken the candy. Well, we shall need her as a witness when we catch him, said Al. Ah, said aged Mole, wagging his finger knowingly. That's the problem. She won't remember anything. Why not, said Batty Bat. I bet I'd remember being tied to a tree. Let's get on with the story, said Captain Beaky. What happened then? Ah, yes, said the Mole. It's coming back to me now. He hypnotized her. Snakes can do that, you know. Oh, can they, said Toad? How? He swayed about like this, said the aged mole, and hummed a little tune, and told her she'd remember nothing. And to demonstrate how Hissing Sid had hypnotized Mandy the Mouse, the aged mole stood up and swayed from side to side, humming a little tune. That sort of thing only affects people with weak minds, said Owl. Wouldn't you agree, Captain Beaky? Uh, Captain Beaky? Owl turned to where Captain Beaky had been sitting. Captain Beaky was lying flat on his back, staring at the sky. Ah, oh, that's what happened to me, said the aged mole. And I've only just woken up. Artful Owl took a paintbrush out of the turpentine jar and waved it under Captain Beaky's nose. Oh, wake up, he said. Captain Beaky gave a sneeze and sat up. Er, uh, what happened? Er, uh, what were you saying, he said. 
I was saying, said Al, that only people with weak minds could be hypnotised. Oh, yes, yes, said Captain Beaky. Now, uh, what happened to Mandy the Mouse? Whence it had gone, said the aged mole. I untied her, and I took her home. Well, uh, what about the box of candy, said Tibby Toad. I mean, what happened to that? Oh, he took it with him, said the aged mole. Come on, men, said Captain Beaky. Let's go to where the aged mole saw this happen, and see if we can find a trail. Oh, follow me, then, said the aged mole. And pulling down his moleskin hat, he headed for the woods, followed by Captain Beaky and his band. That is all except for Timid Toad. Oh, come on, Toad, called Al. I can't, said Timid Toad. The paint's dried, and I'm stuck to the ground. After a lot of pulling and heaving and... Ow, you're pulling my arm off, from Toad. They managed to unstick him, and led by the aged mole, they went into the wood. Ah, said Reckless Rat, I've found a clue. And bending down, he picked up a small piece of coloured wrapping paper. It's quite clear, said Al, that Hissing Sid was unable to wait until he got home and started to eat the candy. Here's another, and another. Oh, look, he's left a trail, said Bat. All we have to do, said Al, is to follow this trail, and we'll catch him. Well, what are we waiting for, said Captain Beaky? Come on, men. So, led by their gallant captain, Owl, Toad, Rat, Bat, and the aged Mole all walk through the wood, picking up bits of coloured candy wrappers. I don't like this part of the wood, said Timmy Toad with a shudder. The trees grow so close together that it's all dark and damp. Not only that, the trees seem to be staring at us. They do say, said the aged Mole, that this part of the wood be haunted. Well, I'm not scared of ghosts, said Reckless Rat. Timid Toad's eyes nearly popped out of his head. Did, did you say g -g 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 ghosts, he stammered? I mean, real ghosts. How could they be real ghosts, said Arful Owl, when ghosts aren't real? And bending, he picked up another coloured candy wrapper. How do you know they're not real, said Timid Toad? Because you could see straight through them, said Arful Owl. I must say, said Captain Beaky, glancing round nervously, that it is very cold and damp round here and I can't see any more candy wrappers, so perhaps we'd better call the search off and go back to painting the boat. Al raised his eyebrows. You're not scared, are you? Captain Beaky gave a nervous laugh. What? Uh, me? Scared? <laughs> me, the leader of the bravest animals in the land? <laughs> scared? Good heavens, no! <laughs> the Beakys have a family motto, you know. Oh, really, said Toad, what's that? Brave men run in our family. Well, they run in mine too, said Timmy Toad, and jolly quickly. Bat, who'd been looking anxiously over his shoulder, spoke in his high, squeaky voice. Shall I fly up in the sky and see if I can spot Hissing Sid? I, I probably stand a very good chance of, of seeing him from up there. You wouldn't want to just fly straight home, would you, said Al? Bat crossed his fingers behind his back. No, no, he said. Oh, no. Oh, very well, said Captain Beaky, but do keep in touch. Right, said Batty Bat. Here I go. And flapping his wings, he hopped up and down. And then he started hopping round in circles. What's the matter, said Rat? Isn't the runway long enough? It's the paint on my wings, said Bat. I can't get off the ground. Oh, dear. After a few more despairing flaps, he gave up. The aged mole cupped his hand to his ear. Oh, listen, he said. Can you hear that? Sounds like a very strange noise to me. Listen. That was a long, low moan, said Captain Beaky. Thank heavens I've still got paint in my ears, said Toad. I'm sure I'd be very frightened if I heard it. Oh, come here, Toad, said Al crossly. And pulling a feather from his tail and using it like a pipe cleaner, he cleaned the paint out of both of Toad's ears. Oh, there it is again, said the aged mole. Toad's eyes bulged, and he put his fingers in his ears so that he couldn't hear it. What is it? said Rat in a whisper, and even Rat looked a bit pale, and his long nose twitched anxiously. This time the noise was louder, and they all heard it, even Toad. Oh, I'm getting out of here, cried the aged mole, and he ran off as fast as his aged legs would carry him. So am I, said Bat, and running round in circles, he flapped twice as hard as he'd ever flapped before, but he still couldn't get off the ground. A loud moan, followed by a very loud groan, came from very, very near. This was too much for Captain Beaky, and grasping his hat firmly with both hands, he pulled it down over his eyes. Whatever it was that was haunting the wood, he certainly didn't want to see it. Whatever it is, said Rat, his keen ears twitching, is behind that big old oak tree, just over there, in that very dark shadow. We'll all get very close behind Captain Beaky, said Al, and we'll go and look behind that tree in that very dark shadow, and we'll see what it is. I'm going to keep my hat down over my eyes, said Captain Beaky, just in case the sight of whatever it is behind that dark tree in that very dark shadow makes me go so weak at the knees that I wouldn't be able to run away with the rest of you. So with Al pushing him from behind, and with Reckless Rat and Toad following very closely, they tiptoed towards the big oak tree. But all was quiet and all they could hear was the wind sighing through the leaves and the creaking of the gnarled old branches above their heads. 
another blood-curdling groan came from behind the tree. Captain Beaky stopped and pulled his hat up to reveal eyes that were twice their normal size. It's no good, he said. I can't stand the suspense. Go on, hissed Al. We're nearly there. You don't want the others to think you're not brave, do you? Would you like to go first? whispered Captain Beaky. No, said Al, and gave Captain Beaky a forceful push in the back. Caught by surprise, Captain Beaky tripped over his feet, ran forward and disappeared into the shadows behind the tree. There was another dreadful groan, much louder than before, and then the sound of laughter. Holding his sides and laughing so much he could hardly walk, Captain Beaky appeared in view and beckoned the others to join him. He pointed at something behind the tree. The sight that met their eyes made them all roar with laughter, for lying there on the ground, surrounded by dozens and dozens of empty candy wrappers, was a very sick hissing Sid, and next to him was an empty box of candy. "'He's got indigestion,' said Al. "'That's the price you pay for being so greedy,' said Toad. And walking over, he kicked hissing Sid in the tail. Sid opened one eye. "'Oh, dear,' he hissed. "'I must be very ill. I've just seen a blue toad.' And closing his eye, he gave another long, low groan. The last story I'm going to tell you is called Hissing Sid and the Swimming Lesson. It was a lovely hot spring day in the woods. Grasshoppers were rubbing their legs together to let other grasshoppers know where they were. Bumblebees buzzed sleepily round the wild flowers and herbs, and down by the river, a family of ducklings followed their mother to the water for their first swimming lesson. One by one they jumped in, calling out to the less brave ones, Hey, come in! It's lovely and wet, and, oh, look at me! I can't sink even if I turn head over paddlers! Nearby, from a dark hole at the bottom of an old twisted oak tree, a pair of beady eyes watched these proceedings without blinking. The eyes belonged to none other than the most feared creature in the wood, hissing Sid the snake. On this particular day, Sid was keeping cool in one of his hiding holes, feeling rather depressed, when this family of new ducks marched past for their first swim. As they shouted and splashed, Sid sighed a sad sigh, and wished he had a family to play with. But whenever he tried to join in any sort of woodland game with other animals, just the sight of him, particularly when he smiled, made them hop, jump, or fly off as fast as they could. Once he had made friends with a worm, and had spent hours trying to teach it tricks. But after two weeks, he discovered, to his annoyance, that he'd been talking to the wrong end of the worm, and he'd got very cross and eaten it. Wriggling out of his hole and keeping in the shade, he slithered along the river bank. He'd only gone a few yards when he saw the duck's big nest, made of reeds and rushes, and glued together with lots of mud. Sid couldn't resist a quick peep over the top. Good heavens! He could hardly believe his beady eyes, for right under his nose was a big fluffy ball of feathers, scrabbling up the side and falling back into the bottom with squeaks of annoyance. Anybody looking? No. Good. Opening his mouth and reaching down into the nest, Sid picked up the fluffy ball, which gave a gasp of surprise. It was at that very moment on that same hot spring day that a battered biscuit tin, with the words HMS Most Leaky painted on its side, drifted into view. A limp handkerchief sail hanging from its mast, Captain Beaky sat in the stern with his hat pulled well down over his eyes, one leg over the side, trailing his toe in the warm river water. Batty Bat hung upside down from the mast, fast asleep. An artful owl was out of sight, but his loud snores indicated that he was having forty winks. Of reckless rat and timid toad, there was no sign. Sid froze with fear. Thank heavens all the members of Captain Beaky's band were fast asleep. But all the members of the band were not asleep, for at that moment timid toad, who had been told to keep the HMS most leaky dry, suddenly popped up into view with a tin cup full of water. He was so surprised to see Sid that instead of pouring the water into the river, he poured it back into the boat. "'Wake up, everybody!' shouted Toad. "'It's hissing Sid. He's stealing a bird from a nest.' Captain Beaky leapt up so quickly that he nearly fell overboard. "'Where?' he shouted. "'Where?' And looking round, he peered in every direction. But as he'd forgotten to pull his hat up from over his eyes, he couldn't see anything, except his feet. 
Artful Owl, who was one of those clever people who can wake up in a second, already had a hand over his eyes, shading them from the sun. Oh, look over there on the bank, he cried, pointing. Stop, thief, shouted Timid Toad, safe in the knowledge that he was with brave friends. And then, just to show how brave he felt, he shouted, Wait until I get my hands on you, you slimy snake! Sid felt his heart pounding so loudly that he was sure the whole woodland could hear it. Suddenly, with great speed, he slithered off, heading for his most secret hiding place, with the small bundle of squeaking fluff in his mouth, thinking to himself, Thank goodness there's no wind and Beaky's boat is drifting downstream, and even more, thank goodness, my most secret hiding place is upstream. After a brief struggle with his hat, Captain Beaky managed to pull it up, and blinking in the sunlight he took charge of the situation. Um, full speed ahead, he shouted, and hard a starboard, all hands on deck, and then cupping his hands he shouted, oh, wake up, Bat! Bat was so startled that he let go of the mast and fell onto his head at the bottom of the boat. Ow! said Bat. That hurt! After him! shouted Captain Beaky. Quick! He's getting away! Who? said Bat. Uh, hissing Sid! said Toad. And there's no wind, so we can't chase him. There may not be wind down here on the river, said Arthur Lau, but high up in the sky there's always wind. Pass me that ball of string at the bottom of the boat. Reckless Rat, who'd been fast asleep with his head on the ball of string, woke up with a grunt and said, "'Here, yeah, what's going on? I was having a nice kip down there.' "'We're chasing hissing Sid,' said Timid Toad, passing the string, "'but there's no wind, so we can't.' "'Then why did you bother to wake me up?' said Bat, rubbing his eyes. "'I didn't,' said Owl. "'But now you are awake, tie the string round your ankle and fly as high as you can.' "'That sounds like a bad idea,' said Bat. "'I like it.' "'I can't see the point of it,' said Rat. "'I should have thought it was obvious,' said Owl, "'even to the meanest intelligence, "'that if there is no wind on the river, "'we shall have to find some higher up.' "'Of course,' said Captain Beaky. "'What a good idea! "'A bat-kite to pull the boat. "'We'll soon catch Hissing Sid.' "'Oh, dear,' said Toad, "'very quietly so nobody could hear him, "'and then very loudly so they could all hear, "'Oh, good!' "'The bat flapped up towards the clouds, then stopped. "Dash! he squeaked. Dash, dash, dot, dot, dash. What do you say? said Rat. There's a stupid rat standing on the string, said Owl. Now get off it. By now Sid had slithered round a bend in the river, and he stopped with a sigh of relief. No chance of Captain Beaky and his band catching me now, he thought. He wiped his brow with his tail and put the fluffy bundle down on the grass. Two very cross little eyes stared out of it. Who are you? it squeaked. I'm missing Sid, hissed Sid, and I'm taking you to my most secret hiding place. What for? inquired his captive nervously. I'll ask the questions, hissed Sid. And how is it that you can talk so well when you've only just been born? The bundle of fluffy feathers puffed itself up proudly. I was born yesterday, it said. But I've been in my egg, listening to my brothers and sisters, for three days. So of course I can talk. My egg had an extra thick shell, and was very hard to get out of. Now, why are you taking me to your most secret hiding place? Well, hissed Sid, wriggling about uncomfortably, you see, I don't have anyone to play with, and I was lonely. All I wanted was a friend who'd like me. Sid smiled his best smile and crossed his eyes to look funny, and then, tying his tail in a knot, he hit himself over the head with it and pretended to be hurt. "'Oh, do that again,' said his newfound admirer. "'I did enjoy that.' Uh, <clears throat> "'Later,' hissed Sid, rubbing his head with his tail. Uh, "'How would you like a swimming lesson?' "'Oh, what fun!' said the bundle of fluff. "'By the way, what am I? I mean, no one's told me yet.' Well, "'You're a duck.' his Sid, and gently picking up his new companion by the leg, he slithered to the edge of the bank, leaned over, and opened his mouth. There was a tiny splash, and the fluffy bundle disappeared. Sid's mouth fell open with surprise. It didn't float. What on earth was the matter? A very wet and cross-looking bedraggled bundle of waterlogged fluff popped up to the surface. Glug! Glug, glug, help! it shouted. Glug! and vanished again. 
Sid dived into the water, and rescuing his non-swimming pupil, he threw himself onto the bank. The pupil lay on its back. <coughs> cuckoo! It coughed. Cuckoo! <coughs> cuckoo! Cuckoo! <coughs> oh, said Sid. Oh, what a fool I am. I've been trying to teach you cuckoo to swim. And then taking a deep breath and puffing out his cheeks, he blew on the soggy fluff to try and dry it out. He was still blowing hard when the biscuit tin sailed into view. There he is! shouted Captain Beaky. Quick, men! After him! Hissing Sid had just time to unknot his tail and slither off at full speed when Captain Beaky and his band rushed up the river bank. It's too late, said Al. He's gone. Are you sure? whispered Toad, peering over the side of the boat. Better get this baby back to his mother, said Beaky, before it catches cold. Good gracious, it's a cuckoo, said Al. Their mothers are so lazy, they're always laying eggs in other birds' nests, but in a duck's nest. That's really unusual. We'll have to find another family for it. We'll look after it, said Rat, putting his coat round the cuckoo to keep it warm. No, said Captain Beaky, we're too busy doing good. Oh, said Rat, what a pity. As they sailed off, two beady eyes watched them disappear, and hissing Sid gave a sad sigh. Just then a worm wriggled past his nose. Here, you, is Sid. I'd like to teach you a trick or two. I know some very good ones. But the worm just disappeared down a hole without taking any notice at all. It just wasn't Sid's day. <laughs>